So really quick, so we're going to go into obviously some specifics um, on the high availability, getting down into the SQL layer and actually walk through creating SQL AGs all the way through. So part one, of course, just as a recap, we did the introduction, the fundamentals and the architecture of SharePoint 2013 high availability. In this section, we're going to, in part two, we're going to go into specifics and the details of SQL Server availability groups and obviously the implementation. As a recap, to my right, your left, is Mr. Eric Shups. He's a SharePoint MVP, and our info is on here. The slides will be available for you as well, all of our contact info um, for that. Myself, my name is Miguel Wood. Um, we're both from Dallas, Texas. Nothing could tell that, anything, uh, anything like that. Uh, again, <laughs> it's my accent, right? I don't have the accent. So we're going to jump straight into uh, talking about uh, SQL Server and obviously covering some basics about clustering. Um, I did mention this very briefly at the, very, at the introduction of our last presentation of, of part one in that there is definitely kind of a, a terminology that you're going to have to get used to with the new SQL Server availability groups. I have been doing clustering from the old, old days back in the early or late 90s. Um, and early 2000s with the Microsoft clustering service and everything else. And when I say cluster, or when we talked about cluster, we were typically were talking about a physical cluster, active, 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 passive, where we had two nodes or more that are sharing shared storage on a typically SCSI or SAN device, right? We want to kind of, I want to, it's difficult, especially if you've been around that for a while, to actually shift some of the terminology. So we're going to go through some of this terminology. We're going to be specific to SQL Server as well, because that is obviously a data layer for SharePoint. But when we talk about that, there's really two options that we typically have for high availability with SQL. We have the classic cluster, the SQL Server cluster. What we refer to that as is the failover cluster instance, right? That's the whole instance, and it fails over as an instance. This is the classic active passive, if I've got one active um, instance, or active active I have two, where I could literally have an active on each, each different node. That is also referred to by its beautiful acronym of FCI. So if you actually start reading some of the doc documentation, and it will confuse you, because I'll use those and bounce back and forth in documentation of TechNet and MSDN of FCI and AGs. AGs being the other type of high availability, availability group. And the biggest difference between those two are going to be where the storage is. You've got shared storage for the FCI, and for an availability group, you have local storage, which means all the data is local to the instance, and we actually have two instances. Additionally, both all the instances in an availability group are running, which offers some interesting pieces that Eric alluded to in the first part, which was being able to read replicas. Imagine the benefit if I'm only doing read operations that I could actually literally specify that I want to read only a secondary where I'm not going to inter interfere with the heavy intensive uh, transactional processing that's going on my primary replica, primarily writing, right, or updating. Does that make sense? That's important. So let's go, go ahead and touch on a couple of these different terms. I'm going to come back over here and do it from here so you guys can see it, okay? The underlying technology is required for both SQL Server failover cluster instances and availability groups comes from the OS, from Windows Server 2012 or Windows Server 2012 R2, um, uh, and we're talking about the server failover clustering service, or typically referred to as WSFC. It's required, it provides that. Now, for those people that have worked with clustering before, the classic clustering service, you will do everything from the failover cluster manager. If you're using availability groups, you never do any operations or work on the availability group within the failover cluster manager. That's a very, very, I still turn it on so I can see to see if I'm having any challenges with resources or, or events and the underlying base service, but nothing is done at, on that manager for uh, availability groups, okay? Remember the difference here that we talk about between the FCIs and availability groups is the FCIs are instance level and availability groups are all the way down to a single database level. Okay? Or a group of databases, one or more databases as a group. So you can't have, obviously, failovers of databases inside of an availability group going over to another one. It's a whole availability group to actually fail over. Does that make sense? So I do want to point out, you'll notice up here that we have different numbers of replicas that we can have. 
The primary replica is the one that we refer to as answering all um, full, fully executable, in other words, full transactions, including updates and writes. That's the primary replica. Why do I say that? Because I already told you the secondary replicas can actually be read uh, intent, meaning I, if I can, let's go ahead and read there, or read only, et cetera. However, we also talked about in, section, in part one about synchronous versus asynchronous um, um, <laughs> fail, well, not failover, but asynchronous say, replication. <laughs> and of course, everyone understands that from the synchronous perspective, we're talking about where we actually know that the, the data was written on the other one before it actually even writes back on the primary. However, we can only have a maximum of two secondary synchronous um, uh, rep, uh, replicas. Everything else we can have as asynchronous. Even if I'm dealing with 2014, which if you'll notice, allows for eight secondary replicas. I can still only have three that are synchronous, including the primary. Does that make sense? Okay, um, what, what, this, uh, what this diagram also shows is kind of what we talked about at the very end of part one where we said, you know, you could technically have, yes, sir? You talked about the eight replicas, eight yes. nodes? Eight secondary, yes, eight nodes. Now, what I've done, so just so to be clear, so you can see this, in 2012, I can have up to five nodes, the primary and actually four secondaries. Of those four secondaries, remember, I, either, I can only have two additional synchronous. So I can have three synchronous and two asynchronous. We can't, so you gotta remember what happens when we do the synchronous is we're actually t setting the transaction log over and waiting for the response that actually wrote over there before we actually write back on the primary, okay? That's one of the reasons you don't see an increase in, in uh, secondary replica, synchronous replicas in 2014. You still only have three, maximum of three, primary and two secondary synchronous replicas, but you can now have up to six more, six more asynchronous. Why? Asynchronous is different than the synchronous. It's not waiting back for, for the communication back from the uh, synchronous replica. It simply sends a transaction log and says, that's fine, great, good, and lets me know if I'm actually eventually I'll get the communication back. Now think about what this means from a SharePoint perspective. What did we say earlier about, I had that table up about the service applications, what supported sync and what supported async. And I told you earlier, for all intents and purposes, synchronous is really your only option for full SharePoint supportability. So even though the documents say, and they're a little obtuse in their language on this, that you can have four or eight secondary replicas, that doesn't mean you can have one primary and then seven other places or, or eight other places to fail over to for SharePoint. It means you can still only have one primary and two failover replicas because really SharePoint needs to be synchronous in your failover scenario, right? So these numbers are almost meaningless. We put them on the slide because it's confusing in the documentation if you haven't done this before. <laughs> when you're architecting, plan for one primary and two secondary, and that's it for SharePoint, because you're gonna want them all to be synchronous. I know that's a blanket statement and it doesn't apply in all scenarios. There are cases where asynchronous um, may make sense for you, but for the most part in SharePoint, when you're designing, plan on one plus two. And, and, and there's a couple things I do wanna point out to that. Remember, and, I, and I, I, I don't think anyone in this audience is gonna have that confusion. High availability and disaster recovery are two different things here. We're talking about high availability. In a disaster recovery situation, that's where your asynchronous could possibly come into play. I want to be very clear. Um, so do not confuse high availability with, uh, with the, with the um, disaster recovery. DR is not the same. Um, but I did want to point out, you'll notice that uh, we actually have multiple subnets. We're actually crossing subnets, possibly data centers, where we actually have a SQL Server failover cluster instance. Let's assume there's only one instance, so it's active passive situation. There's still only one server that's actually active at that moment in time. But it's one of the nodes, a secondary replica. I do want to still call out, remember, if I am using, and that node in a availability group is a failover cluster instance in SQL Server, it cannot have automatic turn, uh, failover turned on, as, as you pointed out before in the comment and question you had before. Does that make sense? A couple other things I just want to touch on. Um, we already talked about synchronous and asynchronous. Optional read-only replicas, that, in fact, that hotfix, one of the hotfixes, that .NET hotfix that we mentioned to support um, SQL Server AG um, availability groups actually allows for the .NET um, SQL client to put in the read-only, read intent, 
um, and one other option in the transact SQL could to, for communication. Um, listener. What is the listener? The AGL, or Available Group Listener, is basically a virtual computer object that is created in Active Directory. It's, not me it's basically a virtual machine name and DNS entry. One of the reasons you have to have permission to create computer accounts in AD when you use the wizard to create the AG, as you'll see a little bit later on. So think of that, because now I actually have two virtual machines that are created up into, as computer objects in AD. One from the failover cluster service that's running on the nodes, the underlying base cluster service, and one from the SQL Server AGL, or uh, Availability Group Listener. Everyone clear on that? Or Crystal? Clear. Crystal clear. A note on spanning multiple subnets. Yes. Okay, there be dragons. <laughs> yeah. if, if you are going to have availability groups that span subnets, that is supported. Be very, very careful about your network latency uh, across those. It needs to be as low as possible. I would recommend that you have a direct connection between the environments, which would mean uh, either you have an MPLS direct tunnel uh, to those. Uh, I, I don't care for site-to-site -site VPN because of the latency over the VPN. Uh, that would be probably the worst way you could implement it, but you need to have some sort of direct connection between those environments. The longer the latency, the more chance that something's going to happen between those synchronous commits. And the more data that you have, the more you're exponentially increasing your risk. So even though it's supported, be very, very careful. Get with your network folks and make sure that they understand that low latency is king when it comes to doing failover across multiple subnets. And of course, even along that, that note, not just latency, but typically when I have clients that are testing latency, they don't have any of the normal traffic on, the, on that, uh, on that uh, connection. So you start increasing bandwidth and actually getting into bandwidth issues, your latency obviously decreases, so it could have effects. So make sure that you're getting the latency test while you're actually having a full operational uh, communication across that network channel. Yes, sir. There's, um, I forget exactly what it is now, but there's, uh, there's something that applications, some applications can support the multiple subnet. Um, you know, so if, if you're running on a multiple subnet and the listener fails over, there's certain applications that can have that alternate IP address. and. Uh, I don't know whether SharePoint supports that. Uh, so it's not actually SharePoint that has to support it. It's the connection that I talked about. Remember that .NET hotfix? So .NET 4.0 already has it in there. The .NET 3.5, that was the other option. So remember, it was only read intent. The other one is multi-subnet failover. So that is a switch in transact SQL in the connection string for the SQL client in .NET. And that .NET hotfix for 3.51 that we talked about that was required, that actually turns on or basically puts in your connection string for SQL, those three options. They're not there by default and only available after the hotfix. And all SharePoint will well, well, yes, because they're going to be using the .NET SQL connection uh, object. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good, good point, good call out. Um, but it has to be, it's not necessarily the applications. Obviously, we're assuming the applications are using um, .NET SQL client connection. Good call out, thank you. Um, okay, aliases. Guys, if you're not using aliases, this was another thing that was, <laughs> I, I will Go get back to SharePoint admin upset. school. And, and it, even if you're only going to have one availability group, make sure you have multiple aliases. We'll talk about some of the optional things of actually making sure you have multiple availability groups in SharePoint, because remember, it's a group. So if you have one big massive availability group for SharePoint with all your databases in it, guess what fails over? All of those databases. But why not simply take and separate them out into little pieces? I'm going to tell a funny story on Miguel now. <laughs> I, got, I got called into a client after Miguel had gone in and set up all of their avail high availability and done the whole thing. And so I had to validate the configuration. So I'm going through the configuration. And because I already know Miguel, I can assume that he did it right. But you still have to do the check. So I went through. And one of the things I noticed is that there's five SQL aliases in the machine, right? Why do you need five SQL aliases on a machine when one or two will do the trick? So I had to call him and go, dude, what are you doing, right? Um, what's going on here? And the answer, interestingly enough, uh, makes a whole lot of sense. I don't know if you need to take it to the extreme level of having five, but um, what he did was he grouped service applications into their own aliases, such that the um, user profile service was one, 
right? Uh, the secure store and some of the other ones were in another alias, right? The content databases all had their own alias. And he created an availability group for each one of those aliases so that he could actually fail over groups of databases at a time and SharePoint would still function as opposed to failing over the entirety all in one shot. And I thought that was a really clever way to approach incrementalizing your availability group failover. The odds that one of those is going to go down as opposed to others are probably slim, but if you're in a SAN environment like this customer was, he matched the LUNs that those databases were associated with to his availability group to his listener, right? Therefore, if we lose the LUN, we fail over that group of databases, right, until the LUN comes back online and then we fail them back. We don't have to do the whole SharePoint failover uh, instance, right? So I actually got schooled on that one. I thought it was calling him out for doing something <laughs> silly, and I got schooled, and it was actually the right way to do it. And if you want to know more about that, we can answer some more questions later on how that works, but it's a really effective way to do granular failover. Uh, my question to this uh, example of you, was that uh, SharePoint uh, my implementation was working? Did, Did it, it work? work? Yes. Yes. So how, how come the five aliases talk to the config data? They don't. So the config database was one alias itself. In fact, the, for, for what I typically do is I put the config and the central admin content database in one alias, in one availability group. There's another reason I do that, by the way. So he mentioned, obviously, the most critical from a high availability perspective, but I can actually basically use two nodes or three nodes as an active, active, and actually have databases at responding to different database instances. But it works fine. Remember, what it, if you're using... If you're using, for instance, the wizard, the SharePoint configuration wizard, and you actually have only one entry. Did anybody here set up a production farm using the configuration wizard? If you did, get out. With one of my clients. Yeah? I recently had this issue with one of my clients. They are using alias, mm -hmm. and they installed SharePoint with the instance. The UPA was not working. The what? The user profile services was not working. Well, that doesn't. Uh, so we put, we put, we put on one alias. We mm -hmm. put all the all the deployment, all the installation, and the configuration, and it start working. No, uh, you, you can you can Something separate. Something else out. was misconfigured. Yeah, it's just there. so so. Remember, if I do SharePoint, let's take aliases out of out of the picture. I can put every single database on a separate instance. And that's, I mean, that, that has nothing, I don't think that has anything to do with the alias as it does. There could have been a miscommunication. I've also had people, don't forget it's 64-bit, and there's sometimes some confu confusion. I've had people do the aliases on the 32-bit, and then, of course, they don't work when you actually do the 64-bit. Yeah. Remember, there's two CLI, CON, FGs to do the client configuration we're doing this for the UI. I use PowerShell. Everything I do is PowerShell. So I don't know specifically, but there is no issues on that whatsoever. And in fact, I've, we've got environments that are obviously Live doing that here. Mine as well. No, no. I'd be glad to get into more specifics yes. afterwards. I just add one last question. Is nothing different if for SharePoint for five, five uh, aliases? SharePoint just sees this as five different SQL servers. Bingo. That's it. That's it. And they show up. And remember that Azure IaaS in the first thing where I said that you had that, it's not turned on? You go and see that. They are not using aliases either. That's the other thing that I pointed out, and I, I would. Uh. All right. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, my. Your, are you, my turn or your turn? You, me? Okay. Go good. On. All right. We, we can cover. Both of us can cover the whole thing, so it's not big. So uh, again, multiple listeners for scalability, which is what we we're just talking about. I got into pretty good detail, very good commentary as well. It is the best practice. If you're not using aliases, you should be, because you'll actually, whenever you have a SQL Server issue, you'll wish you did. Trust me, because I can very quickly change that. On a storage, remember, um, we have two different pieces. On the FCIs, it's shared storage. So we're talking about either the classic shared SAN or iSCSI, directly attached storage, uh, fiber channel, uh, obviously a lot of uh, options. But what happens is the storage is owned by whatever the active member of that instance is at that moment in time, okay? From an availability group, and this is critical from a storage perspective, as I mentioned in the first part, is you need to have all the local storage for everything that you have in the availability group on each instance of the SQL server that's in the availability group. So if I have four nodes, guess what? I have to have four times the storage. And if I've got, I don't know, several terabytes, 20 terabytes, 30 terabytes of storage, I have to have that for four times over. 
So that does have obviously a cost, although storage is not as expensive as it used to be. Yeah, and when you're doing your architectural design, you need to take that into account. If you're going to have two nodes in your availability group cluster, you need to double your storage computations, mm -hmm. right? Because each one has to have the same amount. There's no shared storage. You can't just have a pool like you do in, in failover cluster instances that's shared between them. Each one has to have their own. They can be on a SAN, that's fine, right? So it can be uh, network attached, or whatever, have fiber channel, however you want to have that configured, but it's, it's double. Uh, you go to a third one, and it's triple. Ah, uh, good question. Automatic failover. Yeah. So in FCI, we can do manual, which is fine, and that, that works for some business scenarios, right? But if you want automatic failover, then you have to bite the bullet uh, and go with the extra storage. Uh, theoretically, storage is cheap. I know it's not that way in reality when we get into these big SAN systems and all that um, sort of stuff. But if they're willing to bite the bullet on high availability to begin with, then they've got to be willing to write the check. Um, for the extra storage, and if they're not, then you need to back the whole conversation up and, and say, oh, should we really be going down? I, I think money, and I mentioned that before, I have different conversations. From a CFO perspective, if I want to do FCI, don't forget, you have to now purchase the Windows Server Hardware uh, ca uh, Compatibility List FCI Hardware. With an availability group, I don't have to do that. I can even mix and match. I don't have to have matching servers I don't have to have identical hardware, and I don't have to have the shared storage. Or a matching storage. A matching yeah. storage, exactly. Right. Does that make sense? So, so when, I, when you take a look at the difference, if you have to buy a cluster hardware versus just a normal server, it, th that will shock you too. Remember, because it's an exorbitant, exorbitant amount, almost an order of magnitude more, to buy cluster approved hardware from Windows, for Windows Server. And I'm talking about the FCI piece, not the availability group. So that's another reason that I typically talk. Again. Requirements drive everything. Um, one more thing I want to mention on the, on the uh, quorums. We've been hitting on the file share quorum. Remember, the only reason we're typically talking about the file share is we've been only talking about two nodes. So the only time I have to have a file share or possibly a disk witness quorum, which is what we typically do for the FCI, is when I have an even number of nodes. If, for instance, I had three nodes in the availability group, then guess what? I don't need to necessarily do that. But the type of majority or type of quorum that I define in the Windows Server failover cluster is different. That's where it's defined that we're actually using either a file share or whether we're using um, a actually node majority, which if I had odd number of nodes. Same reason we actually have this, the three nodes for, um, for high availability for the WFM, okay? I just wanted to call that out. So it's not necessary to use a file share, um, only if you go uh, if, if you want to. Performance, I think uh, Eric actually touched on this fairly, fairly quickly. Um, performance, we do have a performance hit. There can be a performance hit. We're actually, especially from a synchronous perspective, remember we're waiting for that transaction log uh, check that, that's written to the transaction log to, to the primary replica before we actually send it even back to, to the client. You want to mention? Yeah, let me talk about that for a moment because I've had several debates with customers now about if we're failing over to a secondary instance, do we have to have it match our production environment? Do we need to spend all that money to have it exactly match what we have in production? The answer is no, you don't. You just have to have minimal capability to run the workloads that you have defined, right? So one of the, uh, we deal with this in Texas all the time as, as uh, Miguel mentioned, and in Louisiana as well, we have to worry about hurricanes. So we have to have inland data centers as opposed to coastal data centers, right? Uh, and so the, the drive is to always minimize the cost of those additional DR um, environments. And they have to be HA. They have to be able to fail over to these things immediately because sometimes you have very little warning that you have an impending uh, event. And they want to reduce cost, right? That You can do that, but be aware when you do, your users are going to suffer from performance issues and you have to plan for that. People need to be made aware because the user doesn't necessarily know whether your data bases are in Dallas or Houston, right? They don't really care. All they know is something happened and now everything is slow, right? So if you're gonna cut corners, right, on your DR environment, okay, be aware at some point it's gonna come back, right? And they're gonna be saying it's your fault. The last thing that I think a customer wants in the middle of dealing with a disaster situation is have the help desk going nuts because everything says SharePoint is too slow. Uh, 
right? It's bad enough we have to worry about our data uh, actually uh, being there and people can still function. So what I try to tell folks is it's a lot easier to have the conversation up front and just say, yes, we have to match our environment from, from primary to secondary rather than come back later and say now we need to justify additional costs because we didn't when we did the failover it didn't perform as well because by then you've already got egg on your face. But if you're in that discussion with the customer and they say, well, well, do we have to have it that way? No, you don't have to have it that way, but we highly recommend that you do have a matching environment so that you don't suffer from performance issues. Also be aware of the, the performance between your locations uh, when you're transferring data. Right? Make sure you have enough bandwidth across those links to actually do the data transfer. You may think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. My content databases are only 100 gig. It's not that big of a problem. Well, if you put everything in an availability group, you've got a whole lot more than just your content databases shoving data down that wire. It's all your databases shoving data down that wire. Make sure you have enough bandwidth between locations and test it under a real failover scenario. Okay, let's try. All right, you ready? Yeah. I think, yeah. We're going to swap mics really quick. Okay, so in this demonstration, we are going to build a cluster from the ground up. Same scenario as I showed you in the previous uh, demo. Can you switch me over? All right, uh, so we have a uh, Hyper-V environment. I have two SQL servers and I have one uh, Windows Domain Controller. My Windows Domain Controller is going to contain my file share witness for my cluster. My two SQL servers are 2014. Uh, at this point, they're just base SQL servers uh, with the uh, Windows Server failover clustering component installed. So I'll bring up one of the SQL servers and we're going to start by actually building out our cluster. So we'll go to the failover cluster manager and start the build. Before you do this, before you start building your cluster, uh, right after you've installed the .NET 3.5 components on the machine, go back and install the KB article that was on the previous slide. Otherwise, partway through this, you've got something that doesn't work. Yes, Christian. Uh, enterprise. Okay, uh, to repeat the question, does this require SQL Standard Edition or SQL Enterprise Edition? SQL Enterprise Edition is the answer to that question. Okay, so we're gonna start by creating a new cluster. And we'll walk through the wizard. Uh, the first thing we have to do is add our two SQL nodes. So these are my two SQL, SQL 2014A, that's the machine that I'm on here, and SQL 2014B. Verify your network connectivity first, of course, because it's actually going out and verifying those uh, servers. And by all means, make sure you can reach your Active Directory server. Okay, uh, so the next thing is that there's a set of validation tests that it's going to do to make sure that your, uh, fail your components meet the minimum requirements for failover um, clustering. For the most part, in 2012, um, R2 and SQL 2014, you should out of the box pretty much be able to pass all of the uh, validation tests. In 2008 R2, that wasn't the case. There was a lot of things you had to get configured uh, right, so my apologies if you've had to go through that painful process in 2008 R2. Uh, it is better uh, in 2012 and running SQL 2014. So we're going to click Next, and it's going to run through the validation tests. And we'll choose run all tests and go. All right, and it's going to go through and check our disk. And you, you may get some uh, errors and issues in this report. Most of them are inconsequential to actually getting the cluster running. We'll take a look. Let's see if it flagged any is red. Uh, so disk assets, latent, latency, SCSI device, I'm running on uh, Hyper-V virtual guest, so it's obviously going to throw some issues uh, about my disk. We'll let that finish running through. While that's going, <clears throat> while that's going there's one more thing I want to point out. Every time that you run this validation test and you're doing it for only availability groups, 
remember this is the Windows Server failover cluster service. So one of the things it's going to throw warnings for every time, unless you have shared disks, typically for an FCI, is it's going to throw warnings, I don't see any shared, shared disks that are actually seen from both nodes. Does that make sense? Remember with, when we're doing availability groups, it's only local storage. And since we're doing only local storage, this validation check to see if the failover cluster service is going to run well on both nodes is going to fail. Not fail, but throw a whole bunch of warnings. Does that make sense? Because we're not using, we're not doing a clustering service, we're actually doing AG, so there's no need for shared disks. But in a typical FCI, you're going to obviously want to have that. So we're almost done um, here. As soon as it uh, finishes running through these tests, we can move on to the next um, stage of actually generating uh, the cluster. Uh, this will go faster or slower depending on your network configuration and the latency you have uh, between the machines. Uh, I, for whatever reason, this validating network communication always takes forever. I have no idea why. No matter how big the machines or, or how fast they are, it just always seems to take forever. Right? Uh, so even though, there we go, even though I had a few uh, warning items on there, the test has completed successfully, I have the minimum capability here to run uh, a cluster. And you can browse through here and see what the warnings are that it, that it puts forward. The important part is that it says you have completed successfully so that we can then move on to the creation of the cluster. So I'm going to give it a cluster name. I'm not very creative, so we're going to call it SP Cluster. All right? Uh, and we are going to give our cluster I can get it to come up here, a network IP address, and we're going to choose next. Is this added as a VIM in the DNS already? No, you have to go add it later okay. um, and make sure it's set up. Whoop. Aha. Well, it already found a computer account uh, for me for SP Cluster. Hey. So, so to your point, it actually, remember I said there was two times it creates a computer object. One thing that we should be clear on, obviously he's a local admin, but he's, you're also using a domain admin account yeah, yeah. that has permission to create a computer object in AD. Remember it's simply a computer object but doesn't reference a true computer. It's like the virtual IP or vi virtual no, uh, uh, computer name that we had back in the old cluster server piece. But, yes. yes. I'm just, I've already run through this, so there's an already an object in my domain. So I'm just going to, rather than go delete that object out of AD, I'm just going to give it a different name for the cluster. So we'll call that cluster2. All right, and I'll go and create the object. If the user account that you're using doesn't have permission to create objects, then you've got a problem here because it's going to try and do it uh, automatically. So make sure running under account uh, that has those permissions. Or um, uh, make sure that they've already created um, a service account that you can use, for example, um, to do this. The validation check will see if you have permission, but it'll only throw a warning if you don't, because you could technically go ahead and pre-create a computer object that's going to be used when you actually do that. Okay. Now, for those of you who've set up clusters before, this is a dangerous tick box down here at the bottom that says add all eligible storage to the cluster, because it'll actually add local storage on your machines to the cluster. Do not panic. This is for availability groups only, okay? We check this box here because we're running a file share witness. We don't have to worry about our local um, storage cluster uh, configuration. In fact, we're not even going to go into the cluster manager and set up our local storage resources because we don't need them. Okay, so I know that some of you probably just went, whoa, whoa what is that? Uh, go ahead and check that box and continue on, even though it, uh, every fiber of you says, don't do that. So we'll let it create the cluster, and it's actually going to come up when we're done with uh, creating the cluster. It's actually going to give us a warning about the fact that we have no quorum disk. And here it is. No appropriate disk could be found for the quorum disk, right? What's going to happen when you try and add all local storage during the cluster configuration process, right? Saying, I have no, there's no shared storage. I have no idea what you're doing. That's okay. We don't really care. So you can ignore that and carry on. Okay. So now we have the failover cluster uh, manager uh, in place, okay? If... Now, there's really not much more for us to do from the failover cluster manager. From this point forward, it's going to be our availability groups uh, that get uh, set up. One thing we do, however, need to do is make sure we have some correct Active Directory permissions for adding some of the things that are going to happen during the AG, like creating the AG listener. Right? Uh, so let's switch over to our Active Directory machine. Oops. Uh, 
We'll go to Active Directory Users and Computers, go to the domain, and make sure we have that cluster two that we've uh, just created assign the proper permissions. So I'll go to Computers, Properties, whoops. All right, if I could click on the right thing, it might help. There we go. Why am I not getting to the right object? Oh, I didn't turn on advanced, duh. There we are. Always some little box you forget to tick, isn't it? All right, security. Go to the security tab. All right, go down to advanced. Go to add. All right, uh, and we need to give the uh, object SP cluster two was the one we just created. Uh oh. Try that again. SP. Isn't that what I named it? Yeah, but you have computers as Oh. Well, that would help, wouldn't that? Yeah. If I tick that box there. Yay. Okay. Um, so we need to make sure that we have uh, read all and create. Where's create in the list? Create computer objects. If you can find it in this silly list. Create, there it is, create computer objects. All right, there we are, now we're good. Okay. Now we've given that uh, cluster object sufficient permissions in Active Directory that we can carry on uh, with um, configuring our quorum. So let's come back to SQL, there we are. Okay. And from our uh, failover uh, cluster or the failover cluster manager, right? We'll come in here and we'll do um, more actions, configure cluster quorum settings, okay? And this is where we're going to set up our file share witness, okay? uh, So in this case, we're going to do select a quorum witness. Next, configure a file share witness. Next, and we're going to give it a file share path. In this case, it's my domain control dash DC slash cluster demo. Choose next. And it'll create the file share witness for us. And it's done. Okay. All right. Uh, so now we have our cluster set up and we have our witness set up. That's all the availability groups needs. None of that other stuff around setting up all of our network stuff and our storage and failover cluster not required. All right? Okay, so from make sure that we first have availability groups turned on even though the feature is there. All right, let me rephrase that. Hopefully when the DBA installed SQL, they checked the little box for always on availability groups because if they didn't, you're going to have to go back to the SQL installer and run it again to add that feature. Okay, so make sure that, that was there in the first place. Otherwise, this next step is not going to exist at all. SQL server, that's not even how it's typed in French. SQL server config uration manager. There it is. <laughs> Have I told you that I hate Windows 8? Have I mentioned that? Conf Yeah, and then you click on the wrong one, like I just did. Oh, right, there we go. All right, so to the configuration uh, manager, uh, to the SQL Server services, SQL Server here. This is my instance, which is SharePoint uh, on this particular box. Okay, To the properties and to always on high availability. Make sure that is checked for SQL cluster two, which should already be entered from setting up the failover cluster. We'll see that for you automatically and you have to turn it on, okay? And then you have to start and stop SQL. So services, boy, this machine is fast. Okay, SQL, I said SQL, there we are. SharePoint, let's restart that. And while that's 
doing its thing, we're going to come over to the other SQL server and we're going to do the exact same thing. SQL Server Configuration Manager, eventually, there it is. To your SharePoint instance and turn on Always On High Availability. Done and services. Otherwise, it won't be able to see this as a secondary replica when you set up the availability groups on the primary. There's my instance and restart. Okay, so I'm good to go back to the primary. Okay. Now, you need to know, there's something you need to know about this particular configuration. This is not strictly required, but highly, highly recommended. Before you go any further, go into SQL Management Studio on each of your machines. Go to the server, properties. Advanced, come all the way down here at the bottom and set your max degree of parallelism, right? Two, somebody in the crowd already knows, one, okay? It should be done, well, it, yes, but if your SQL is used for other things besides SharePoint, then there may be a reason for not having that set, okay? My recommendation, always set that. In fact, it's not just mine, Microsoft also tells you to do that, yes. instances on that shared environment? Would that work? You, you can do, yeah, so let's assume you have multiple instances on one server. Yeah, yeah, yes, that would work, but be careful because you still have to have the minimum number of resources that you would have to have to run SharePoint SQL, right? Which is four cores, 16 gigs, right? So you can actually have the resource governor and actually limit it, but make sure that you've done the capacity planning for what you absolutely need, right? It's a good point. It is possible. In and there are a lot of environments where, especially when they have massive database uh, uh, environments, platforms. Okay, so I'm just going to create a test database. Here, we'll just call it test DB. Okay, nothing fancy. With this one, it's just to test out our availability groups. So now I have a test database. And the first thing that I have to do is I actually have to perform a full backup of this database. Otherwise, it will throw an error to me uh, when I try and add it to an availability group, okay? So I back that database up. Now I can create a new availability group. So I'll come down here to my availability groups, choose new availability group wizard. And if I can get it to show me all the buttons, there we go. Okay, uh, we'll give it a name, let's call this AG. SharePoint, even though it's my little test database. Choose next, okay? And it'll, it'll check and make sure that the prerequisites, the prerequisites are you backed it up. That's the prerequisite, okay? Yes. You wanna answer that? So the reason you have to do the backup is two reasons. When we actually create the uh, secondary replica, we actually pass the backup and it restores it and then actually uses transactions logs to catch it up. Uh, one more thing, you can obviously use a file share, which is going to be through the wizard. Typically, we actually just push it back up to a file share that cannot be accessed. But you could technically, if it was a massive database, and it was a, uh, you wanted to offload it and then take it over and actually put it up there, you'd actually literally do the backup restore without obviously restoring, without starting the service. And then that obviously gets that uh, transaction log caught up uh, very quickly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, so the next thing that we have to do is we have to add our secondary uh, replica here. So I'm going to add my replica, and that will be my other SQL instance. So I'll choose my other SQL instance, connect, and it'll add it here, okay, primary and secondary. Now notice the next two options in that grid. Automatic failover. 
up to two, primary, secondary. Okay? Synchronous commit, up to three, primary plus two. We talked about that earlier, right? This is your maximum of three that you can have for, <coughs> uh, for your synchronous commit, okay? And then whether you're setting it to um, readable, no, yes, or read intent only, okay? So setting it to no, which is a bit of a backwards way to do it, means read write, okay? Um, whereas if you say yes, it means read only, okay? Or read intent only is the last option, okay? Uh, so there's our, my primary and my secondary with my failover and my synchronous commit uh, set up. The next thing I need to do is I need to create my availability group listener. So we're going to give it a name, S-P-A-G, and it's going to give me an error if I use the one that was there before, so I'll give it uh, another one. Okay. Now, this is a weird dialog because the button that I want is actually hidden down here, right? So I have to, if I come here, I can go tab, add. You didn't actually see me click the button. It's just my screen resolution. There's an add and remove button hiding down below that. Right? You all knew that, right? You all know it was there. Okay. Um, so I clicked that, magic and mystery. Uh, and I'm going to give it a IP address. So I gave the cluster an IP address of 120. Okay. Uh, so in my very creative numbering scheme, I'm going to make this one 121. Obviously very scalable. Uh, and that's going to add the IP address for my AG listener. The AG listener is what you're going to point your SQL alias to. If you want to have multiple aliases, point them to multiple listeners, right? Make sure that they're mapped uh, correctly so that each one has a proper IP address uh, that it's connected to. But before, okay? you, before you hit next, there's one more thing that we didn't really speak a lot on, and that's that tab right there that you see, Backup Preference. One of the benefits, huge benefits, and obviously I'm sure if you're dealing with massive C uh, SharePoint environments, one of the challenges you probably have are backups. Hmm. Well, the secondary replicas, I can read from them. Hmm, wouldn't it be nice if I could actually do a backup from them as well? Well, you can if it's synchronous, right? So if you actually come over here and click on that backup preferences, you can actually specify which ones you actually would prefer to have the backups run against. That's a very, very powerful piece of AGs as well. Not something you would have with FCIs. Unfortunately, it's not giving me the next button. Oh, you're going to Oh, well, don't we all use 1433? <laughs> Let's not go there. Right? Okay. You didn't just see me type that in. That didn't act. That actually said 5276 or something else. Right. Okay. Uh, so we give it a port. Right. And then we tell it what sort of data synchronization do we want. This is going to be full. This is what's going to actually take the uh, backup that we created uh, and add it to the availability group. Make sure this goes to our file share witness. That's exactly That's right. That's exactly correct. right. And it doesn't have to be the file share witness share. He just already has that configured. It yeah, it could be somewhere else. It just has to be accessible by both, both machines. Correct. Okay. And next. Now it's going to go through and run through all the checks. And one of those checks that it's going to do is actually um, creating, make sure that you can create the object. Now you can dump out this script if you want from here. I'll click finish. And it'll go set all that up for me, including creating the AG listener in DNS. Okay? If, you hadn't, if we hadn't configured those AD properties earlier, it won't create the computer object. You won't get the DNS um, entry. And momentarily, it should work. Maybe. While this is going on, any questions so far? Yes, yes. So there's, there's, a, it gets. So again, there's going to be performance implications, of course, and possibly management as you switch them, right? Management issues as well. But yes, that's possible as well. I will tell you, I don't deal with that as much as I initially did because the cost of storage now, um, even in data centers, with what we can do, even at an SSD level now, is ridiculously low. Now that's not saying that everyone has obviously the sands of SSD sands, right? That's still, that's still happening. But you are correct, that is possible. And again, business requirements, cost requirements, right? 
Always map back to that. If um, one of these fails, it's usually going to be this one here, creating the availability group listener um, uh, in Active Directory. Uh, if that happens, don't panic. Your cluster has still been created, right? It's all good to go. It doesn't mean the AG wasn't actually created. Just go into Active Directory and create the objects um, yourself. There's a TechNet article that tells you what, there's a couple of permissions you have to change on one of the objects when you create it, but it's not that big of a deal, okay? That, that step, which I see, it usually means you've already done this before and it failed and you had to go back and tear it apart and do it again, and then this part will, will fail. Don't panic, okay? Uh, so our wizard is done. We now have a availability group here and we can show the dashboard and it'll show that our primary and our secondary are up and running now at the moment we haven't added any databases to this so let's add a database it'll tell us uh, oh yeah we did because we picked it when we did it didn't we yeah because I ran the wizard that's right okay cancel go away there we go. Okay, so from here, remember we said earlier, you're not gonna use the failover cluster manager to do any of your failovers, okay? You're done with that guy. Don't mess with him anymore. You're gonna do it from here. So if I wanna test the failover of this cluster, I can click this link here to start the failover wizard, and it'll run through a failover scenario for us and switch us to the secondary, okay? It'll say what the secondary is, what my readiness is, click next, connect, and go. And that will do a failover to my secondary instance and you'll see in the dashboard uh, that'll show that what was the primary 2014A is now going to become the secondary which is pretty much just like it looked when we did the SharePoint failover and I turned one of them off. So yes everything is good. Okay. Uh, now it shows what is my, well it will when I refresh eventually. It takes a few minutes for it to catch up uh, to show you that it actually has done the failover. It, trust me, it worked. Just trust me. Okay. Uh, and so you can play with that to make sure it's working. Now, I've only got one database in here um, so far. And if I want to fail it back to uh, the original primary, I can fail it back from here. When you're installing SharePoint, okay, pay attention to the order of operations that you're doing. Do all of this... Right? And then basically ignore it while you're setting up SharePoint. The best results you'll have for configuring a SharePoint environment when you set up always on availability groups is on the initial configuration, point your SQL alias to your primary SQL server name, not the AG listener. Run your deployment for SharePoint and your configuration. So do the install, create your content databases, create your user profile service, create everything that generates a database first, pointing to the primary machine. Why? Because if you go and create those databases and then you add them to the availability group, and, and for example, user profile, if you then have to delete that database and recreate the database, you are going to run into contention issues. At some point, you're going to delete the database, but the availability wizard thinks it's supposed to be failing it over, and it'll flip to your secondary replica, right? So you can't actually delete the database. It gets all out of whack. So during the installation and configuration process, get SharePoint completely set up and configured the way you want it, and then go add all of your databases to the availability group once you're done. Then once you do that, then they'll start synchronizing on the back end, and you'll know that it's in a decent state. Let if you have to go make changes, for example, if you have to reconfigure user profile service, I know it always works the first time, but just in case, um, go and remove that database from the availability group first, then delete it, rerun the configuration, and add it back into uh, the uh, availability group. You remember those SQL aliases we were talking about? So when he says point it to that primary replica, SQL alias points to primary replica because all you have to do then is simply change that alias to the AGL and you're done, right? Whatever that AGL is going to be. Yeah, and let me actually show, so if you haven't done this um, quite this way before, let me, come on. Hurry up already. CLI, thank you. So if you haven't done this before, when you create the um, SQL alias, yes, 
I'm the administrator. Get out of my life. Okay. Um, when you create the alias here, so let's say my alias is SP SQL. When you're doing the install, point it to SQL 2014A. Well, you're not using name pipes in any event. Uh, unless you're doing access services, in which case you have to have name pipes turned on in order for that to work. So this would be my install configuration, okay? Then when I'm done doing the install and adding my availability groups, I go back to the SQL alias on every one of my SharePoint machines, and I change it to uh, whatever I called my listener. That, okay? And now you're pointing to that AG listener, right, which should already have its DNS entry so that it starts reading the databases that are in the availability group. Don't forget to do that step once you're done. Go back and change the um, alias on each one. We usually do it with just a set of PowerShell scripts uh, to run through and make that uh, if change. If you do it via the client. If you do do it via the client configuration tool, the UI right here, don't forget there's two of those things installed. One's for 32-bit and one's for 64-bit. And the WoW 64 is a 32-bit, just so we very, very clear. Just to make it very confusing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any questions on setting up, basic setting up of availability groups? Everybody's good? All right, here we go, back to you. Yes, we have about three minutes oh. until, uh, until we're done. I thought we had extra time. No, we remember they, they went back ah, to the Ah, just keep going. <laughs> I want to make sure that we actually answer any questions or any specific questions with the, with the time. I know that we started right at 11, at, uh, 11 15. We're supposed to end at 12 15. But I want to make sure you have any, if any questions, and it, again, it doesn't have to be specific to the SQL AG. It could be anything about the high availability. Um, and again, don't forget, Eric and I will be available. I was going to go into a little bit of the Azure IaaS, the HA. The only thing I would do if you were in the previous session is remember, it does not set up. There's some things that are not there in the HA piece that are caveats, issues. They are continually updating that template. Um, and remember, that template is actually multiple there. They had the standard SharePoint 2013 on IaaS, as well as a standard HA one in IaaS as well. So uh, the HA one is, it just has obviously some issues you will have to deal with as far as management tools. And the AGL, very like, like Eric did, it only points, initially, the SharePoint still only pointing to the primary node. It's equal one there in that, in that piece. Yes, sir? Once they're out of sync, um, the test that you just did, is that the way to actually test it in a production environment? Or how would you go back if you're doing an actual so drill or a, or, a, or a... Good point. So you'll notice the two things I want to point on that. One is we were doing a manual failover is a full-blown test. Uh, you know, the, the one that we did with the SharePoint where we literally turned off the machine, that's not necessarily a, a good test to do, of course. But the manual failover is a test. Sure it is. It worked. <laughs> that, and it's supposed to, right? But I'm not sure that I would have probably do that with production environment. By the way, typically, just for a timing perspective, it's typically now 21 seconds based on a standard SharePoint, uh, SharePoint installation for that failover to actually occur, automatic failover, with the minimum required resources on the, on the SQL and SharePoint layers. There's two other things I want to point out. To your point, on the automatic failovers, remember when we were setting up the wizard, and I don't typically do it with wizard, I now do it all via PowerShell, is there was two. The number was only set for two. So again, that's two failovers. If I actually have two automatic failovers, it's going to stop. And you've got to be careful about that, of course. I'd probably put a notification in and actually have the, the, a SQL notification come out through email or something like that. From a, so to answer your question about testing, just real quick, it, you can see now it's finally showing in the dashboard that it failed over to 2014B, so that's my test to show that it's working. If I run it again, it'll fail it back to the original, right? So it doesn't actually tell you that, uh, but from a test scenario, just run through the exact same uh, failover again, and it'll bring you right back to your original state from the test. Uh, so, good change. This is a good question. So, remember, it's synchronized. It will not do a failover to a synchronous replica unless it's synchronized. So, and, and, and this is going to get really low. Remember what happens. I'm actually SharePoint. I talk to, I send SQL a transaction, and that transaction doesn't get written yet. It gets written to the log, but shipped, but it's not committed until what? Until it comes back from the synchronous replica, and then it's written to the primary. So it's always going to be, that's why synchronous is so powerful, but it does have, and why the latency has to be so short and so small, is because we have to wait for that transaction to commit on the secondary replica before I'll commit it on the primary. 
Now, that's asynchronous, yes. But remember, the second we go to asynchronous, as Eric pointed out before, we now have an RPO perspective, where we actually have possible data loss. When you're doing a synchronous failover, when he did the wizard, for instance, we'll actually say there's no data loss here because we're synchronized. Although if you were paying attention and you were watching the screen up here, it actually just came up with a red X and said data loss. Ignore that. Okay, don't, <laughs> don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. Now, is it uh, at that point when it first flips over, it's not synchronized? Yeah. It's just saying that my, my secondary no longer has a synchronized copy because it's in the process of failing back over. Relax. Give it a minute. Right. It'll come back. Right. If you're doing a bunch of databases, hold tight because it may take some, some time. There's another question one. back here. here. I'm Anything additional you have to configure for multi-subnet failover? Yes, there is. Um, well, one, obviously, depending on what .NET version you're using, we already talked about that, the .NET, that's, that uh, hotfix is actually a .NET hotfix to allow for the, it's a, there's a transact SQL, it av makes it available. When you're dealing with .NET, there's a multi-subnet failover flag that I can put in a connection string. If it's not in that connection string, when it goes to SQL 2012 or 2014, then it's not going to have a, the ability to do a multi-subnet fa failover. Yes. Well, now we're going to get fun because I love get. So what happens? This is very, very important. In the case that I'm actually rebuilding an AGL or a multi-subnet, so the registry entries for SQL Server availability groups actually go under the Windows Server failover cluster. What does that mean? If for some reason the Windows Server failover cluster service fails and you recreate the WSFC, you have lost everything in the AG. You would actually have to recreate your AG, AGL all over again because mm -hmm. the registry entries are in the node in the registry hive that are underneath WSFC. Does that make sense? I, I know I got super technical, but it's one of those things that you'll probably run across if you're actually doing this to either in test or implementation. I always ran into the issue of, oh, Goodness, shoot, shucks! I just nailed. I just had to redo my WSFC or Windows Server failover cluster. There's also additional stuff that you'd have to configure. I'm gonna get all technical, but I'll be glad to hit it afterwards because it's gonna get noise. Can I ask a small question uh, about automation of this installation process? Can everything be automated? Yes, ma'am. So yes. PowerShell. PowerShell, yes, yes. Okay. Um, a couple things there on the PowerShell. Uh, you're going to want to do not only the a SQL PowerShell, but there's actually a PowerShell module for Windows failover cluster. If you do a get Windows feature um, uh, cluster, failover, fail, fail, failover cluster star, you'll actually see the PowerShell uh, module that's there and available to, to install. It's doable. Yep. Of course it is. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yep. There's one weird, when you're doing it with the PowerShell, there's one weird thing when you're, um, uh, so when you set the, File share witness, where does it happen? There's a timing thing where if you, if you don't give it enough time to validate the file share, then um, it, the script will just keep running, but it's not actually there yet. So it can't, uh, sometimes if it goes too fast, it won't configure. When you're poking the buttons, there's just enough of a delay for it to happen. Uh, so the, I, I think in my script, I have like a five second delay or a 10 second. And I actually have delay. separate scripts. I have a script to do the file. The, oh, you do them separately. I do, I do yeah, two different file too. shares. I do one for the Windows Server failover cluster uh, file share witness, and then I do one for the um, the initial synchronization, where I'm actually putting all the backup, the full backups to pass off to the secondary replicas. Good, good point. Yes. <laughs> they're actually they're, out they're there. They're actually out there. If you uh, Script Center has them, yeah, I've we, modified mine, of course, and. Yeah, because I got all mine from uh, out on the script center and just modified them for my environments, but they're there. Oh, I'd be glad to if you'll shoot me an email. My email is uh, is on the slide deck as well, mwitttechfocus.com, T-K-F-O-C-U-S. Oh, and you can get me on Facebook and, and LinkedIn and all that fun stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Recently, you've got five different data sets with different groups. Yes, so, so remember, if I have all of the, uh, and I, I want to be, because this is actually kind of an interesting piece, because it was the same thing. He, he literally called me up and goes, what the did you do to this client? And I had to explain to him, but I come from a SQL Server background before I moved into SharePoint. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to minimize the resources in consumption. So if there's another benefit of obviously besides grouping all the, the uh, database specific, like all the service applications, uh, the, the config, uh, the content uh, databases, 
I can now spread them to different database nodes and actually lower the, the, the load across all of them. Does that mean? That means if I had like, for instance, three nodes, I could have specific service application databases and availability group running active on this one. My content database is active on, on this one and my config database is active on this one. I spread out the load. It's almost like becoming an active active within and actually still under one instance because I'm actually database grouping it. There's, so there's other benefits to multiple AGs with, of course, aliases, because if you don't have the multiple aliases, then you're, you're right back at the same piece. Does that could help us uh, go away with that uh, initial uh, synchronization uh, uh, limitation for two? That's correct. Yes. That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. It's a way to work around it. <laughs> That's the biggest benefit. No, uh, yeah. there's, there's a bunch of benefits to it. Like I said, and, and honestly, after that, that's when he actually pinged me and said, hey, can we do a presentation about high availability? Yeah, <laughs> that's so how I've started. started using that now as my best practice when I set up to have the multiple listeners like that. Yes, sir. Um, have you had any experience or um, do, have you any advice about deploying the entire SharePoint farm to uh, Hyper-V cluster um, and also the use of scheduled shared farm server? Yeah, so, uh, so first off on the Hyper-V Hyper -V cluster, uh, what kind of advice are you looking at? I have done that. Um, remember now we're actually dealing with not only virtual, um, the actual virtual instances, the guest OSs, but now we're also talking about shared storage for the, for the Hyper-V. And remember when we're talking about high availability, um, at that point we're talking about the high availability of the Hyper-V and not necessarily of the individual virtual. So I, I got to be careful on that. One of the reasons I actually have that diagram and I even put the physical hosts up there is because I have clients say, Yep, we're highly available, and they have all of their virtual servers, their, their guests, on one hardware, one piece of hardware. And so I go, so what happens if I pull this plug over here? That's not highly available, buddy. Sorry, not going to work. Does that make sense? And if you want specifics on the Hyper-V cluster, and the second piece, I didn't hear the second piece, by the way. The scalable shared Oh, goodness. Okay, so we may actually talk after, because there's obviously some cool stuff on that. Um, that Yes. Because I'm not, I've asked Microsoft this before. Um, Azure doesn't support uh, generation two VMs at the moment, and uh, it's a basic failing over from Hyper-V to Azure <coughs> as possible. Yeah, there's, um, so I'm going I'm I'm to reference one, someone else that's actually going to have a, uh, who is doing the site recovery? Is that Kirk? Oh, uh, in um, Azure? No, uh, Harlan, Eric Harlan. Yes, Eric Harlan. Eric Harlan's doing site recovery. To Azure, and you're correct, by the way. So that's obviously something we're waiting for. Although I will, I'm a big Azure fan right now. Um, I'm huge because, but it's changing. Uh, literally within the last four months, I've had to redo so much because things are changing so fast, especially from a hybrid perspective. Like I said, I, I've got that tomorrow. Um, uh, and for those that were interested in the, in the availability groups, uh, my hybrid environment has the five, the five uh, aliases, as I, as I mentioned. Someone else, Eric? Any other questions? Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for joining Thank us. Thank you in very, back -back very much for sticking around. Let's go eat. Thank you.